For a small piece of paper, it can carry a lot of weight. Call it lean, mean, 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 green, the almighty dollar. Don't let it. Don't let, don't let that money fool you. Money can fool people sometimes. People, don't let money, don't let money change you. It will keep on changing, changing up your mind. The OJs. Are you ready to make the most of the only life you have? To make smart money choices focused on achieving what you care about most? Here to help you balance living well today without sacrificing your tomorrow is the retirement answer man, Roger Whitney. Money, especially around retirement, can mess with your mind. I see it all the time. A lot of times when someone's engaging me, it's about the money. No, I'm a financial advisor. I'm an investment advisor. I guess that makes sense to an extent. But I'm amazed at how many times money is the driver of how we live our life. It's the driver of what my retirement can be, of how long I'm going to work or how I'm going to organize my work life. I hear this all the time. I see it all the time. Honestly, I feel it all the time in my life that we put the M before the family, before the occupation, before the recreation, before the fun. And oftentimes, the financial advisors or financial planners are even more money-centric than we are. And so the whole conversation focuses around money first before what we really want our lives to be. Now, we all need money. I need money. You need money to work towards the life that we want, but we can't always make it first. I think that's an important concept to remember as we are going through this retirement plan live case study is that we don't start about the money, we start about the life. And once we define what that ideal life is, like we did last week with Lori and Bruce, then we count the money, which is what we're gonna do in this episode after this disclaimer. Yep, time for that all-important disclaimer. Don't take advice from me on the show. We're talking a lot about money today. We're talking a lot about your life and Lori and Bruce's life. Now, I'm not giving advice to Lori and Bruce in this live case study. This is for educational purposes, even for them. We're using it as a vehicle to help you get an insight into some of the conversations and steps you might want to take to create a great retirement. But this is not advice. So think of this as helpful hints in education before you make any decisions. Definitely makes sense to talk to your legal advisor, your tax advisor, or your financial advisor. Now, let's go talk about this money thing and count the cost. So in the news today, and this is hot off the press, and you might not realize this, but nobody feels like they have enough money. (laughs) Yeah, it's true. I'm telling you. Nobody feels like they have enough money. I've had the pleasure of walking life with people of normal means and people that we would all consider by far above the top 1%. And let me tell you something. Everybody has the same fears and the same worries. Different scales, different levels of sophistication and complication, but everybody worries about their money. And I tell you this because you are probably sitting there feeling like, you know, maybe I don't have quite enough. If I just had X amount more, I wouldn't worry about this retirement thing. I wouldn't worry about my life. I'm here to tell you it doesn't matter how much you have or how little you have, you're going to worry. So that's just part of the deal, I guess, of being human, right? So last week, we talked about dreaming up an ideal retirement, and we started with the four, the family, the occupation, what are you going to do with your life, and the recreation, what kind of fun are you going to have in your life? And those are where you should start when you're thinking about this next phase of life, retirement, a time of more freedom, whatever you want to call it. That's always the best place to start because that is truly about you and what kind of life you want, the four. Now, if we expand that by one letter to form the M being money, once you know what you want for your family, once you know what you want for your occupation, what's going to get you out of bed in the morning, even in retirement, And once you know what you want for your recreation, your fun and adventure in life, once you have that defined, like we did last week, and hopefully you planned along with Lori and Bruce, now we need to focus on the money. What money and resources do we have to try to work towards that life? And the key here is we don't start with the M. Form has the M at the end for a reason. 
Now, usually the money part is why people go to advisors, and that's okay. But to figure out what to do with the money, we need to know what you want in your life. So what we're going to do today in the practical planning segment is we are going to talk with Lori about, okay, what resources do they have to provide for the life that they defined last week on the show? We're going to talk about what income sources they have, Social Security, part-time income, inheritance, all those types of things. We're going to organize what financial resources they have coming in. And then we're going to build a net worth statement. I am a huge fan of net worth statements. If you've listened to the show long enough, you know that that's the financial dashboard where we can negotiate to work towards that great life. So a net worth statement as a refresher is a one-page sheet on the left-hand side you have listed all of your assets, things that you own. So that'd be your bank accounts, your investment accounts, your retirement accounts, the IRAs, the 401ks, the house, anything that has value that you own. And on the right side of the, the, the piece of paper is all the debt that you have. Could be a mortgage, could be a car loan, could be a student loan, all sorts of debts. And then you take all of your assets, you add up the total, and you subtract the total of the debts. And that is your net worth. Now, there are a couple different ways you can parse a net worth. Is You can look at it from cash reserves, taxable investments, tax-free investments like Roths and things like that, tax-deferred investments like IRAs and 401ks, things you haven't paid taxes on yet. And then what I call you know, private investments, that could be your business, that could be rental real estate and things like that, usually in the taxable category. And then the last one is use assets. So there's this concept of productive assets and a use asset. I think it's important to understand because sometimes we can feel wealthier than we may be because we have, say, a, a cottage or a second home that we go to and we use and we enjoy. And we, you definitely want to have that on your balance sheet. But that would be considered something called a use asset, meaning that the return on it is the enjoyment that you get out of it. And it only becomes a productive asset if you were to rent it out or you were to sell it because it's not producing income for you. It's not necessarily growing in a way that you can access to provide for your lifestyle. So when we're looking at balance sheets and when you're building your balance sheet, and I'll talk to you how here in a second, you want to make sure you have some distinguishing, if I said that right, of what is a use asset and what is a productive asset. Because if you have a lot of use assets, RVs, houses, things, they maybe have some value to them, but they're not producing income and you can't really use the money until you sell it and turn it into a productive asset. Whereas a productive asset would be obviously your investment portfolios, real estate that's investment for investment purposes, things that are actually producing income or some type of return for you. So what we're going to talk about with Lori and Bruce today is we're going to build that net worth statement because that's going to be, we got to organize what we have in assets and then what income sources we have to see where the opportunities and the risks are to working towards that ideal retirement that they defined last week. So as you're doing this, don't worry if you've never built one or never organized one, because in the Smart Sprint segment, I'm going to talk about how you can get access to some worksheets to help organize what income sources you have, and also how to build your net worth statement so you can get organized and you'll get a copy of some worksheets you can use in Six Shot Saturday's email. So if you're not signed up for Six Shot Saturday, probably a good idea to do that. What you'll get is you'll get worksheets to work through this segment, just like we did last week. Plus, you'll get a summary of Lori and Bruce's financials and goals so you can follow along with them as well. So if you're not signed up for Six Shot Saturday, go to rogerwhitney.com. Click on the blog or the podcast link, and there's a little sign-up sheet for Six Shot Saturday, and that way you can be assured to get all the resources to follow along with Lori and Bruce. With that said, let's go see what they have to work towards this retirement they thought of in the practical planning segment. Well, welcome back, Lori. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. After sending out what this ideal retirement looks like, I got a lot of response of basically, what? It's very unusual. And I'm not saying that in a negative way. So I just want to talk about that real quick. And then we'll get into some of the resources. 
And I think a lot of it is, I mean, you had mentioned, I think to me privately, that you guys have already downsized your house and really, I guess in your estimation, right-sized your life for what retirement's going to look like. What was some of the thinking behind that? Well, what we did, we had a about a 4,000 square foot house with a pool, which we loved. And well, I loved it. Bruce didn't really care for the pool, but I took care of the pool and we had kids over, you know, with my daughter and all of that. But then when she moved out, then I was tired of cleaning the pool every day because we didn't have a service. And we thought it's time to move. It took us six years to find this house, I think because we didn't really get serious about it. But when we did finally get serious about it, then now we're in about a 21 square foot house and everything is paid off. We don't have any debt. We haven't had debt for years. Um, We were very fortunate when my parents died, they left us an inheritance. And one of the first things we did was pay off our house. And then the rest of it, we just saved. And so we've just had a lifestyle where we pay for things as we go, our cars, our house, whatever. And now we're in our final, hopefully, house. And we're very happy here. When we moved in, it was our house sold quicker than we thought. So we moved in in the demo phase and we lived in rubble for about six months, but everybody said, Oh, you shouldn't live there. You shouldn't live there while you're doing all that construction, but we didn't really want to get an apartment. We have a dog and I didn't want to mess with all that. So we just lived in rubble for about six months. So let let me ask you when you were in the 4,000 square foot house, it's a big house. That is big. And you had your daughter and you're raising your daughter and going through all that back then. Roughly, what were you guys spending a month to support your lifestyle as it was back then? Do you have an idea? Well, it was a lot more because, well, I had a corporate job myself for 18 years and I loved it, but it was very consuming and I had no time. I was making really good money and I didn't have time to think about what am I going to do with this money? You know, we just stuck it in the bank or whatever. And I didn't have time to enjoy anything. And I was always working. And so that's, you know, we could afford that house, but, you know, the expenses were a whole lot more, you know, our air conditioning, our heat and the taxes and the insurance, it was a whole lot more, but we were making a lot more money do back you, then. Do you remember roughly what you were spending a month for your family household back when you had your daughter and everything was going on? It was probably more 3000 3500 Okay. Still then. on the low end though. Still on the it, low end. We still are on the low end. We're not I guess we're not very exciting people. We're just very frugal and my mom was like that and my husband's like that. We were just raised that way. We're just not very spendy type of people. Yeah. I don't know if frugal is the right word. Frugal almost has a negative connotation because it's like you're happy. It's not like you're wanting for yeah. anything. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, this week we're gonna dive into okay, what resources we have to provide for this extravagant lifestyle (laughs) that we created last week. And we're going to start with Social Security. So I think I have your estimates from some of the information you provided. And we're going to start off assuming that you take full retirement, meaning, you know, for you, it'd be at age 66. And the number I have is about 20,400 at age 66. Is that the inaccurate estimate or it looks like you're looking up something I can see you? Yeah. Let me, um, I have it all down here. Yeah. For me, if I retire at mine, it would be, I've got it at about 1500 a month. 1500 So whatever a month. that be. Is yeah. It's about 20,000. It's about 20,000. Okay. So yeah. Okay. You know, and it'll go up every year with inflate, you know, like this year they've announced it's going to be a 2% raise in, right. in rate. So, but right now it's going to be that. Now, what about Bruce? His is a little bit lower than mine. If he waited till his full retirement age, his would be, I think like a hundred dollars less okay. a month. Okay. So about 19,000 something. And have you guys had any discussions about that since Bruce is going to be 62 here and when he might take it? Yeah, we have thought about it and we thought about, you know, what that would look like. We're still we're holding off for now and we're still considering that. So we'll make up our minds. I mean, there's not a big hurry. Even when January comes, we've got enough cash that we can cover our expenses. So we'd rather do it right the first time than have to back out. Yeah. 
Okay. And so this is timely for us then. We'll talk about Social Security maximization on the results webinar and look at all the different strategies for the two of you. But then in our private work together as a thank you, we can definitely dial that in to help you make a good decision that fits for you. So that's going to be the first line of defense to provide for the lifestyle that you want, right? Right. And bluntly, that's a, you know, given the lifestyle that you guys are really happy with, that goes almost 90% of the way there, doesn't it? It does. When I add up, and that's why I think I'm not too worried about it right now, because looking at our combined monthly, that's more than what we spend. So our social security will more than pay for our current lifestyle. And not many people can probably say that. Yeah, no doubt. Many people feel like they're struggling to make ends meet just on Social Security. Right. So now we don't have factored in any kind of other income. So how long, now you work as a virtual assistant for businesses. Right. And you make about 24000 a year doing that. Mm -hmm. How long do you think you're going to do that? Till my FRA, full retirement age, which will be, you know, 66 in two months. Okay. So the four months maybe. So the plan Uh, there is to do what you're doing till Medicare basically. Yeah. Okay. What about Bruce? Yeah, as far as working? Is he gonna, you think he'll make money when he retires? Well, I think so. I think he'll find something. Even if it's just being a freelance handyman kind of person, I think he would like doing that. He really enjoys helping people. So I can see him doing that. I mean, he already does it for people from church. I mean, he's glad to go do that. I don't know what I'm going to do when my father-in-law passes. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to need Bruce to move down here next to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need he can fix anything. I mean, I'm handy, yeah. but I don't have the know-how. I have the, you know, willing to do it, the work, but mm-hmm. I don't have like having done it a million times mechanically, right? So you guys will have to move to the Dallas-Fort Worth area when yeah, my father-in-law Yeah, sure. Passes. Yeah, it's kind of a bigger cost of living. I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think that he'll, should we, I guess my question is, should we factor in some income for him or you think it's better not to? I think it's better to do it because I think he'll do something. Okay. It may not be, it may take in, you know, four to six months, but he'll do something. Okay. Well, let's factor that in then. Let's say that it doesn't happen until 2019 because he's going to have a honeymoon period. He's got to get all the water barrels. You said that he'll probably wait a little bit when after right. he retires. So how much do you think a year should we factor in that he'll earn? I would think maybe 15000 15000 Okay. I don't think he'll do anything really big, but I could be wrong, okay. but 15 to 20,000. Okay. And then how many years do you think he'll do that? Probably not more than five. Okay. So we'll put four. Okay. And then we'll have it increased by inflation. Now we just sort of make some of these assumptions. It may seem flippantly, but it's really not because we could spend two hours really trying to nail down what Bruce is going to earn. Mm -hmm. But the honest thing is we have no clue. And I don't think he has a clue because he doesn't know what he's going to do yet. Right. So really what we're doing is we want to have a placeholder for it that's reasonable. And then as your life unfolds, you just keep tweaking what that number is as you, you you gain more visibility every step you take going forward. Right. Okay. So we have some good resources. We pretty much have a done deal right here, likely, of between Social Security and your work and then his work. We definitely have the early part of retirement pretty much taken care of. Now, you know, so really it's okay, longevity. I think really what we'll have to dial in, and this will be on the results webinar, is what happens if life throws us a curveball. Right. Right, in some way. So we have the income sources. Are there any other things that we missed there? Not unless we're going to talk about investment income or is that later on? Yeah, that will be later on. That gets factored in when we talk about your productive assets. So let's just review together the assets that you guys have accumulated. So I have a 401k for Bruce of about Mm $16,500. And we're not contributing anything there. No, not at the end of the year. He'll be done with that. Yeah. And then you have cash reserves of $110,000. Right. Okay. Which is pretty ample, especially for, I'm assuming that's gearing up because of coming retirement. That's what you're going to live on. Well, it's actually because we haven't done anything with it. I was kind of wanting to use that money to get a rental house, but Bruce doesn't want any part of being a landlord. So the money just kind of stayed there in that account. And now we know we're not going to do that. So we're going to you know, decide what to do with it and invest it. But right now it's, it's just cash. Okay. So part of the decision is, okay, how much 
eventually do you keep his cash reserves? And then how do you best allocate the rest of that money? Right. Okay. Now in the rental house, let's stop there for a quick second. Is the idea of having to deal with the people and right. Okay. Yeah. Now, have you looked at, you know, there are management companies that will do that for you. Right. Uh, yeah, there are. And they think usually yeah. charge 10 to 15% to do that. But he didn't, since he wasn't really excited about it and he would be the one to do all the repairs, it didn't seem really fair for him to force him into to Good. doing that. Okay. Good point. Good point. So we have the cash count of 110000 that we have to figure out, or you guys have to figure out what to do with. Mm-hmm. And then you have your an HSA of about $7,800. Mm-hmm. And then a joint investment account of 72000 Right. And then two smaller Roth IRAs. You have a Roth of 5500 and Bruce has a Roth of 1500 Right. And then the last thing we have on the investment assets is your traditional IRA of 310000 Right. You're diversified more than most in that you have some after-tax assets. It's not all piled into IRAs, which is nice. Right, yeah. Which is nice. And we're not making any contributions to any of these because you're real close to retirement. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not making the money I used to. And so we're just, yeah, we have it pretty much set and that's what it's going to be. Okay. Pivot back real quick and talk about your work. So you work as a virtual assistant and you work for some local companies. What do you do for them? Well, mainly I do right now, my focus is mainly on social media. So I do social media for some local businesses with their, you know, their Facebook postings and all of that, Twitter, LinkedIn, things like that. But a couple of other things I do, I get bored just doing one thing. So I also make websites for small companies. Really? And uh, I use WordPress for that and make websites and also maintain them. And I also am a big uh, Microsoft enthusiast and I've gotten into Office 365 and you, helping you, people with re- that. You realize Mainly, we talked I've about kind this. of specialized in SharePoint and OneDrive. And and I know you're an Apple fanboy, but... Um, the, yeah, I was going to... I was trying to interrupt you because as soon as you said that, I had to stop you. Yeah. This really was a pressure point and I had to do some soul searching as to whether this was going to work with us because you're such a Microsoft zealot. And and I've heard you talk about your yeah. Apple, your Apple fetishes. So yeah. <laughs> so I wasn't sure about it either. You think I'm in a cult probably because you know, that's yeah. what Apple people are. <laughs> um, so are, have you always had a tech background? Yes, I always have. I Another thing I did, I'm not doing it now, but I was, there's a, a guy here that I was helping him with his IT business. So he kind of trained me how to, get rid of computer viruses and do some basic networking and getting computers ready for businesses. So, but even before that, I was always the kind of the tech person in my office. And I always thought, I wish I had time to learn how to do this and that. And now I do. And I've learned not a whole, not enough, but I know more than the basic person about how to fix a computer and all of that. But it wasn't your career when you were full-time corporate. No. When I was in corporate, I was an administrative assistant. Okay. But I was still the tech person. You know, there's always a tech person in your office and not, and I was it. Okay. And then, so you're already in pretirement, really. I am. Yeah. yeah. Totally. How did you find your clients as a well, virtual assistant? When I, when I was in my corporate job, I got laid off. And so they, I got a really good buyout package, which was very nice. And I took a class on how to become a virtual assistant. It's not the skills you have, you have to have those, but it's how to structure your business, your boundaries and your standards and who you're going to work with and things like that. So I just, I went through that course and, you know, I started blogging years ago just on different tech aspects. And I also, As a graduate of this course, I also got access to people who were looking for people. And so I could look at, you know, who's looking for someone and then say, you know, I'd like to talk to you about it. So I've got some clients that way. And I started with clients around the country. And that was fun because my corporate work, I work with people all around the country too. And, but then I found that I really kind of missed seeing people and working with you know, getting to really know some people locally. And some of my clients I did get to know, I did get to meet them, but then I kind of decided, I think I'd rather work for local people. And that's when I started uh, doing some IT work with this guy. He was actually one of my clients and then he needed help with his business. So he kind of trained me to help him with 
computers and, you know, fixing them and things like that. And then social media came about because it wasn't really around 10 years ago when I started. There wasn't everything that there is now. So I learned about social media and saw that people really needed that. And I got referrals. Okay. And that's kind of how I got my clients. Where did you take the class? It was called Admin U. And how did I find that? It must have been on the internet. I was searching for what, what I wanted to do. And I wasn't really wanting to plunge into another corporate type thing. And the settlement I got or whatever was really is very generous. And I had some time to take off. In fact, we took a trip. We took a two-week trip to Canada and just had a really good time when I didn't have to work anymore. And I still remember the day after I, I didn't have my job and I was working from home. I still went to my office at eight o'clock in the morning and sat there, even though the phone was turned off. I thought it was just so weird. Okay. Now that was kind of like a retirement moment. You know, you get up that day and for people who really go to the office, that would be a big change. Yeah. But, and for me, that was a big change. And but then I decided to go this other way. And even though I'd never thought I would be self-employed and I could make more money if I really worked at it more, but I'm happy. I'm happy with my freedom. Yeah. So I like that. You know, it's interesting that you were working with people all over the country and then you missed the connection. The, you but know, I got to see those people. Yeah. We would have meetings. So I did know them in real life, but your clients that you have that you just meet over the phone. And, you know, I had some in Boston and out East and, you know, here and there. And I just kind of missed the personal connection yeah, with I get it. That. And I love this about the two of you is because you are this virtual assistant, you know, mature lady who gets the internet and is, you know, taught herself tech savvy, right? Mm -hmm. To some degree. Right. And then on the other end, you have your husband who's about to start pre-tirement mm -hmm. after his little honeymoon period. That's going to be your traditional handyman that is tech savvy, but more in, you know, the hard stuff. Right. And each one can work. Which I think That's so right. Cool. He says, I'm, I'm hardware and you're software. <laughs> and even when I would bring computers home, I said, I don't know how to open this up. Will you open this up? And I need to get the hard drive out, but I don't know how to open this stupid case up. And he would figure it out. So he always says, you're software and I'm hardware. Hey, I like that. I like that. <laughs> Bruce is a smart guy. So to sum this up, we have investment assets of about $523,000. Right. And then you have your house, which is paid mm -hmm. for worth about $215,000. Are there any other assets that we've left out? No, that's okay. about it. Now, are there, just to wrap this up, are there any inheritances that you might be receiving? You said that you had prior, but are there any in the future that you might oh, want to anticipate? There could be on his side of the family, but some really odd things would have to take place okay. for that to happen. So probably not. Okay, best not to factor that in. Yeah, are there any people that you might have to support, whether that's parents or? No, mine have already passed on and his are all taken care of and they're in an assisted living and their expenses are being handled. So we shouldn't have to, there shouldn't be any expenses there. Okay. Well, now we have the financial resources to figure out whether we can fund this ideal retirement. In our next conversation, what we're going to do is we're going to just talk about some risks. We're talking about investment risk, long-term care risk, all the risks that are out there, and just try to quantify them, identify them and quantify them so we can figure out how you might, whether we need to deal with them or not. Okay. Sound good? Great. Thanks. Hey, welcome to the Happy Lab, where we noodle on, well, living a happy life. So one of the things that makes me very happy, that I'm glad that I do, I'm glad I actually feel in a position where I can do that, is giving to people in a special way that hopefully speaks to them in where they're at right now. So I'll give you two examples that just happened here recently. So I was on the phone with a client, and she's going through some turmoil, just life turmoil, right? And something like we all do. And she's Christian, and she hasn't found a church that has really made her happy. So she's feeling a little disconnected from her God. So I sent her a daily devotional book called Jesus Calling. 
Now, it doesn't have to be about Christianity. It can be about whatever you want to have it be about. But this was just this particular situation, because I knew that she was a believer, or is a believer, and she felt disconnected, and she was going through some troubles. And I sent her this because it's been a book that I read every morning, and it's really helped me in my journey and to stay centered when I start my day. And it felt so good to be able to send that to her, seeing and hearing from her that she's struggling a little bit right now. And I'm never going to follow up on whether she got it or not, but it just feels good to be able to reach out when you hear somebody in a specific way need something, right? Now, I'll give you another example. Nicole, awesome sidekick Nicole, who's on the show. She hasn't been on recently, but she's coming back when we get back to questions and answers. She's married and she has a husband who has a job and it's stressful and they have two young boys, you know, four and six. Is that right, Nicole? She'll, she'll tell me. And came around Halloween time. And I actually meant to do this last year and I didn't do it. So just out of the blue, I made sure that her husband, Clay, had the fart machine that I love to use during Halloween when I dress up as a whoopee cushion. And it's this little box and it has like 24 different fart sounds and it has a little remote control. I had so much joy and so much happiness sending this to their home directly to him without ever telling them. And then him sending me a text just telling me how he's tricking the boys with it and just laughing. It feels so good. It makes me happy to help make other people happy in some special way. So I guess my point to you is, it doesn't have to be a big dollar amount. I think that machine was like $15. When next time you hear someone that you care about or that you're thinking about and you see a way to speak in their life in a very special way, I'm going to suggest that you do it because I bet you it makes you happy. On your marks, get set. And we're off on the smart sprint, and you're going to guess what it is, because we're in the middle of Retirement Plan Live. In the next seven days, if you haven't already, create a net worth statement, and you're going to get an email with two resources, one from the Retirement Workbook and a worksheet on how to build a net worth statement that we have in the Learning Library. Grab those, and if you've never created a net worth statement, create one. It can be a little intimidating. Because you're facing facts. But at the end of the day, we're all at where we're at. We can't worry about the past. We just have to figure out how to be proactive about the future. So build a net worth statement. And then number two, maybe on the back of that net worth statement or on a little separate spreadsheet, put in the income sources you think you're going to have during retirement. That could include Social Security, could include pension, could include inheritance, rental income, part-time work. So you have an idea of, okay, this is what I'm going to be receiving, and just make a rough guesstimate on this. Oh, yeah, and on the net worth statement, don't worry about getting it down to the penny. Start with just having a good estimate of what the values are so you don't get bogged down. You can dial that in later. The important thing is to take this initial step to organizing your resources so you can make sure it's focused on creating the life that you want. So that's your charge. If you want those worksheets, you'll need Six Shots Saturday or go to the Learning Center. And get that done in the next seven days. So you talk about being able to do fun things for people. Over the last two weeks, I've said, hey, the book, Rock Retirement, a simple guide to help you take control and be more optimistic about the future. That's my book that is coming out March of 2018. So it's still a ways away, but I'm really excited about it. And I have a ton of copies in my house that I had delivered from the publisher. Even though the paperback doesn't come out until March, the Kindle version is available today. I'm not sure why that happened. The publisher hasn't explained that to me yet. But the deal is, if you buy the Kindle version, read it, and give an honest review in Amazon on the Kindle page, and send me a screenshot of the review that you gave as a verified purchaser, I will send you a special signed pre-release edition because it's not coming out till March, of the book absolutely free, including shipping and everything. I'll eat all that to get the book in your hands if you buy the Amazon Kindle version and leave a review. So I think that's a win-win. And so far, the reviews have been good. Every time I see a new one or someone emails me, I'm like, oh my goodness, what are they going to say? And so far, it's been good. So I'm holding my breath, but I think you'll enjoy it. And I think it will help you create the retirement you want. Until next week, this is Roger Whitney, the Retirement Answer Man. We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of Retirement Answer Man. 
Be sure to visit rogerwhitney.com slash answers to access the Retirement Answer Library with over 30 checklists to help you make the most of the only life you have. Remember, you have more power than you realize to create an amazing life starting today with Retirement Answer Man. The opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Have a wonderful day.